good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gil Rogers, the Director of Marketing and Outreach for Zinch. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to thank you all for taking the time out of your super busy schedules to uh, join us for our special presentation today. Uh, this webinar is one in the series of webinars that we do on professional development and helping um, college admissions, enrollment managers, uh, counselors, uh, and all professionals that work with students making resources available to you to be able to help you support the students that you work with every day. Uh, today's webinar is a partnership between Zinch and the Center for Student Opportunity, uh, showcasing their, new, their newest initiative titled I'm First. Um, and, and at this time, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to the Executive Director of the Center for Student Opportunity, Matt Rubinoff, who will introduce our panelists and get us started. Thanks so much, Gil, and, and thanks to Zinch for having us. Uh, thanks to all of you guys also for, for joining us today. We know uh, you guys are, are buried in applications, um, but hope that, that this provides a, a welcome respite um, and, and an informative uh, hour for you guys. Um, I'm pleased to, to be joined with a, a few special guests uh, who you'll be hearing from later in the presentation. Uh, Daniel Lugo is the Vice President and Dean of Admission at, at Franklin and Marshall College uh, and, and a good friend of, of both I'm First and, and Zinch, uh, so we're, we're looking forward to, to uh, hearing from him a bit later. And uh, also um, uh, joined uh, by Krista D'Amelio, who, who works on the I'm First team uh, with uh, colleges and universities. Um, so. Uh, thank you both for, for, for being with us today, and, and you can look forward to hearing from them uh, uh, in a bit. So we assume that, that you guys have chosen to join us uh, today because either individually or, or institutionally or, or hopefully both, uh, you, you care about first-generation college students, and, and rightfully so, um, because we believe strongly that there's something special about being first. Uh, we. Uh, we celebrate the first in flight, uh, the first man on the moon, the first African-American president, first kisses, first impressions, uh, and, and first place. And just like the Wright brothers and, and Neil Armstrong and, and Barack Obama, we feel strongly that first-generation college students are breaking barriers and, and beating the odds to, to, the, to, to make it to and through college. There's more than 15 million students enrolled in post-secondary institutions today, and nearly 30% of those are low-income first-generation college students. Although I just saw an article yesterday that, that quoted maybe a more recent study uh, and estimated that that number uh, of first-gen students is actually closer to 50%. Um, unfortunately, though, of this population, only 36% of first-generation college students even aspire to a bachelor's degree or higher compared to 78% for whom at least one parent has a bachelor's degree. And there remains a significant gap in preparation for students who would be first-generation college. 45% take the SAT or ACT, that's compared to 82% for whom at least one parent has a bachelor's degree, and only 26% even apply to a four-year institution, compare that to 71% for whom at least one parent has a bachelor's degree. And for those who do make it to college, uh, persistence and, and completion remain a challenge. Only 29% of first-generation students enroll in, in any post-secondary institution immediately after high school graduation. Compare that to 73% of students whose parents do have a bachelor's degree. And only 11% will graduate with a bachelor's degree uh, within six years. Uh, compare that to 55% uh, of non-first-gen students. So all of this goes to saying that it, it, it's a no-brainer that, that for students who don't have a family history of higher education, being among the first generation in your family to attend and complete college requires support, advice, and encouragement. Uh, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, uh, that's not found at home or one's school, or even in one's community. Uh, so, so what can we do uh, as, as nonprofit practitioners and institutions of higher education um, uh, to improve college access and success for first-generation college students? Obviously, 
there's no uh, silver bullet and, and there are many factors to the education system and, and family structures that are, are going to need to improve uh, in order to, to increase the, the rates of, of college access and success for first generation students. But, but, but all of us in, in, in some way, shape or form can, can do our part to, to address these challenges and, and help students overcome these obstacles. Um, at CSO, and I'm first, uh, we, we've set out to build an online community uh, that's going to celebrate first generation college graduates and students who will be, um, as well as provide important support to the next generation of students who will be first. Inspired by the It Gets Better project, uh, this fall we launched the I'm First project uh, at at imfirst.org um, and uh, invite you guys if you if you aren't already familiar um, to, to check it out when we uh, when we break up from this webinar uh, or, uh, or or when you have the chance I'm, I'm going to open up the the live website for us here um, in a nutshell we are uh, collecting pledges and stories uh, from first generation college graduates and students who will be, uh, really building this national effort to put a face to who are first generation college uh, students and offer some inspiration and advice and motivation uh, to the next generation of students who will be first. Uh, if I scroll back up to the top here, you'll see the immediate call to action is, is, is to take the pledge. Um, the I'm First pledge is inviting aspiring students, current first generation college students, uh, first generation college graduates, or really any parent, friend, counselor, or mentor who supports this student population uh, to join this collective effort to help inspire and encourage uh, the future generations of, of first generation college graduates. If you're a first generation college graduate yourself, uh, very much invite you to take the pledge um, and, 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 and after that, uh, invite you to share your own story. Um, we are inviting uh, those who uh, have a story to share and, and want to be part of this project uh, to create a short YouTube video um, telling their stories uh, and offering a piece of advice or motivation uh, to, uh, to future students on our website. So there are some tips and instructions uh, you can find here for doing so. Um, they're meant to be user created videos, uh, just you in front of your webcam or, or on your smartphone device. Um, create a, a short uh, uh, video under three minutes, upload it to YouTube, and, uh, and then provide us that YouTube link and we'll add it uh, to, uh, to this campaign. We also would love your help to, to share this project with your campus community. Uh, current first generation college students, uh, alumni, faculty and staff who are first generation college graduates um, are invited to, to join the effort and encouraged to share their own stories uh, as well. Um, so please, uh, you know, on your own time, uh, check out what's going on here as we're building this community. Watch some of the videos and hopefully you feel inspired to uh, take the pledge yourself and, uh, and share your own personal story. Uh, for the benefit of, uh, of, of future students who are working hard to, to themselves become first in their family to go to college. And obviously help us uh, spread the word and, and raise awareness uh, for the project among your campus community. One of the stories um, uh, featured on the website, which uh, we're not going to play for you today um, because we have the, the, the man himself uh, joining us, uh, comes from Daniel Lugo, who, uh, as I mentioned um, uh, earlier, is the, the Vice President and Dean of Admission at, at Franklin and Marshall College. He himself is a, is a first generation college graduate. And uh, we've invited Dan to, to join us today uh, to not only share his, his personal story, uh, but to discuss uh, some of the efforts that he's helping to lead at Franklin and Marshall uh, in support of, of first-generation college uh, students. So, Dan, you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, thanks for the incredibly uh, generous uh, introduction, uh, Matt. 
and, and thank you, uh, Gil, and the folks at Zinch for uh, the, your, your great partnership in, in all of this work and for this series of really important continuing education that we get to do with these webinars. Um, and pretty soon you'll be hearing from Krista, who's going to give you, uh, I, I know, what will be a much better presentation than, than I'm going to give. Um, I, I think this is an issue of some very uh, significant national uh, importance. Uh, I think we're all very, very much aware of the tremendous demographic change that the country uh, has already undergone and will continue to be uh, undergoing um, over the next uh, uh, decade and more. Um, where you know recent data, as, as you know, the, the, the Wichi uh, uh, data just was released, 40% of all, all uh, high school graduates in 2020 being from communities of color, um, and sitting at an institution like Franklin and Marshall, where uh, you know our uh, uh, costs uh, of attendance uh, are, are, are of, of pretty uh, pretty expensive. Uh, to the tune of about $56,000, and when you think about how needs-based analysis goes, only 8% of the population really being in a sweet spot to pay that. We've got a big issue of how are we going to get uh, students that come from a background like myself uh, to and through uh, college. I think the uh, uh, style that we're, we're using in telling stories through the Center of Student Opportunity is really powerful. Uh, I'm embarrassed a little bit by uh, the, the, the job that I did in telling my own story, but I thought it was uh, incredibly important um, that, that students uh, that are coming through the pipeline um, can really uh, tangibly see people that have taken those same steps and that, heck, uh, if someone uh, uh, like myself can do it, that they can do it. So, you know, in, in, in a short nutshell, uh, I am a first-generation college graduate, uh, and you know, I came from a, a, a wonderful family in a working class background in the South Shore of, of Long Island. Uh, I was fortunate to have two parents, uh, one of four uh, 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 children, and I was the only child to uh, actually go to college, and I was the youngest uh, in that family. There was always an expectation that I would go to a college, but we really didn't have the sophistication to really understand the differences between colleges, and we also didn't understand how we would actually afford to go. Uh, even back in the 80s, it was kind of a daunting thought of how we would pay for uh, attending schools. And uh, the financial aid uh, model that, that was in, in existence then, as well as now, was confusing. Uh, it's sad to say that some, you know, uh, 30 or, or, or odd years later, we haven't improved our language uh, to make it more accessible for folks. But um, I didn't understand what need-based financial aid meant. And so my parents thought that you would, of course, go to uh, either the, uh, the community college nearby on Long Island or those were great opportunities, and they are great opportunities to attend a SUNY school, but thinking of going to a private school was completely, um, you know, out of, out of our minds. For whatever reason, I, uh, I, 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 I was uh, a, a happy uh, a recipient of lots of mail. Uh, apparently I had good breakfast on the day that, you know, I took the PSAT where enough folks were interested to, to mail things to me. And one of the uh, uh, colleges that communicated with me was this small college in Northfield, Minnesota um, called Carleton College. And they kind of stuck in my heart and in my mind. And even though my parents uh, frowned upon me applying to private schools, I applied to them. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, I got in uh, by some surprise. And lo and behold, after doing the financial aid uh, 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 forms and FAFSA documents, uh, it actually turned out to be the most affordable choice. Um, it, it really makes me uh, nervous to think about how many families were like me that just completely uh, ruled out schools like Carleton uh, just because of the sticker price. So, you know, back in the 80s, the, uh, the, the drive around uh, uh, college access was that. It was getting students to college. Um, but there was less uh, around in supporting students getting from a place like Amityville, Long Island, where I went to the public high school, where uh, the uh, minority population even then was uh, the majority population in the school building. Um, and when you got to college, there wasn't as much, uh, I guess, uh, expertise in supporting students from these different backgrounds, uh, especially, especially as you can imagine, uh, southern Minnesota not being very similar to my experience in New York. Uh, for lots of different uh, demographic and cultural uh, reasons. So I, I, I take from that experience that uh, even though I was a, a, a 
smart enough kid to, to, to figure things out academically. I was definitely at risk um, socially, and I was at risk uh, in a lot of ways that I, I would have never anticipated, and that, quite frankly, colleges weren't prepared to support people uh, at that level. That wasn't a part of their mandate. So I, I, as I continue to, to do work in this area, I'm, I'm, I'm more focused on what colleges are doing to support students as they arrive, as they transition, um, and launching them. Um, to being first-generation graduates. You know, the, the, the first-generation college attender is going to be also the first uh, person in their family to graduate from college and perhaps be the first person to uh, go to graduate school. I was fortunate enough to go to law school, and that was a whole nother uh, escapade, if I would put it that way. Positive one, but uh, perhaps not the best planned one and not the most uh, thought-out experience. Um, so thinking about what to do uh, getting to college through college and beyond college is definitely um, what's most important these days. So I'm very, very proud uh, to be uh, on the senior leadership team at Franklin and Marshall College here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, where the college has embraced uh, a, a new vision of being a leader uh, in the nation uh, as a destination uh, for first-generation college students and for students recently uh, underrepresented uh, in selective colleges and launching them on trajectories um, of incredible success. Uh, we are fearlessly led by um, a visionary new leader uh, by the name of Dr. Daniel Porterfield, who uh, has really uh, gathered the entire community from trustees all the way down uh, to, to uh, professional staff and faculty uh, to find our place in uh, uh, developing strategies um, to enroll more students, um, high ability, high talent uh, from communities that we typically didn't see them from. And what's interesting, there's, there's something about this new vision, vision that actually resonates perfectly with the history of Franklin and Marshall. Uh, we've been a, a, a college since 1787 with an incredible uh, history. We're founded by Ben Franklin. And if you look at actually our founding purpose, Ben Franklin gave money uh, to the college to create itself and its purpose was to educate first-generation German immigrants to this part of Pennsylvania. And it's actually quite marvelous to think of how we have almost gone back uh, to embracing those founding principles. Um, so what are we doing here? And, and a lot of it starts, uh, quite frankly, with allocation of resources uh, and money, uh, money in terms of financial aid. Uh, the past five years at Franklin and Marshall, we've seen and, and uh, supported a 77% increase in our institutional grant budget. Um, and we, quite frankly, have bucked a trend where we used to be a school that was a merit aid school, where we, pro we provided uh, aid based on uh, different qualities and different attractiveness factors for students in our pool. We've now moved to, over the past three years, being a 100% need-based school, where we're going to meet the institutional need uh, of every admitted student for all four years, um, and we're very, very excited about that transition of what it's done for us. We're also uh, being innovators and, and, and pioneering creating partnerships um, with uh, great uh, 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 charter management organizations, community-based organizations, and national networks that identify, support, and launch talent uh, to college. Uh, from, from lots of different backgrounds. Uh, we've been a long-standing partner of the Posse organization, and uh, l last year we doubled our commitment. We had always taken a Posse from New York, and now we're taking a, a Posse group also from Miami with a STEM focus. Um, and we've created national partnerships with uh, the Crystal Ray organization, the Mastery Charter organization, um, and the Knowledge is Power program. Um, in addition to uh, uh, adding uh, a, a relationship with, with College Horizons. Um, while those are formal partnerships, we are actively engaged with uh, great charter management organizations like Noble Street in Chicago, Yes Prep, uh, Uncommon Schools, um, just doing the best job we can to source the best talent in the country that are going to be um, ready um, for our type of, uh, of an environment. Um, there's, there's been a lot of uh, information in, in recent press um, about uh, first-generation students, um, but also about students uh, and a phenomenon across the country that I, I might have referred to with myself that we would call undermatch, 
uh, Carolyn Hoxby's uh, recent uh, uh, studies uh, and research that came out in partnership with the College Board demonstrating how so many high performing by the uh, standards uh, of, of SAT performance um, are picking schools that are quite frankly not perfectly or not well suited for the type of rigor that they need. Um, they need to go to stronger places and they're choosing not to. And in fact, there's a huge part of the population that's actually avoiding college in total, which is a shocking um, um, fact, uh, even though they test incredibly well. So uh, on our campus, we're looking for those types of students. Uh, we're assessing everything that we're doing. Um, one of the uh, other innovative programs that we've done is that we've created a summer college residential experience where our, we are inviting uh, 62 uh, students from our partnership organizations from all across the country, from a whole wide range of diverse backgrounds, to have a three-week, uh, all-expense-paid uh, uh, summer with a, a, a stipend for uh, replacement income of, on the money that they could have earned if they were home, um, to first-generation students um, to come to FNM and to really engage in an academic experience to inspire them to want to get a rigorous college experience that, that, that'll launch them. Um, as students get to our campus after they're enrolled, we, we, we think that the, the posse model of giving uh, faculty mentoring uh, to small cohorts of students uh, has, has worked incredibly well for the posse students. And so we've uh, empowered and invested resources in creating other smaller cohorts of, uh, of students from first generation backgrounds to also get that additional uh, faculty mentoring. So there's a lot more to do. Uh, I'm really excited to, uh, you know, report that that uh, in early stages of this work, um, over the past three years of improving our aid commitment and doing lots of interesting things, our first generation college attendance numbers in our entering class have gone from less than 10% um, more than three years ago to uh, in the class of 2016 was 16%. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, but some five or six years ago that our Pell Grant um, eligible students in the class uh, were as low as 8% in the class of 2016. It was 17% coming in. Um, and our student of color numbers have really uh, uh, dramatically uh, improved to be uh, more in line with uh, our, our greater American population where uh, they had been as low as 10%. We're very excited that we're now exceeding 18%. And this is, this is work in progress. Um, we're very excited about where we're going. Um, and I'm very excited to, 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 to partner with Zinch uh, and the Center for Student Opportunity to, to in, ensure um, that we can actually uh, bring to scale uh, enough schools, enough programs that are going to help launch all of these important students to achieve the goals of our country. So that's, that's what I've got to share, uh, uh, Matt and Gil, and um, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so much, Dan. Awesome, awesome remarks. Uh, obviously, Franklin and Marshall is, uh, is is ahead of the curve as as far as this uh, this work goes, and and provides a, a shining example for for other institutions uh, to look uh, to look towards. Um, I think it's. It's awesome that, that you and Dr. Porterfield have really embraced the, this moral imperative uh, to, uh, to serve and support first-generation college students. Um, but I, I also wanted to kind of point out for, for, for those who, who represent institutions that, that maybe are, are, are slower uh, in, in moving towards this direction or, or having, having trouble uh, you know, gaining support or investment from the leadership or administration at their institution to, to, to take this charge uh, and, and strategically uh, focus on and, and, and approach uh, the first generation student population. Uh, it'll be important for us to kind of keep our eyes on what is happening um, uh, with the latest Supreme Court review of, of affirmative action uh, in higher education as, as I think it it's pushing us all to, to think about uh, uh, as broadly as think about inclusion really as broadly as possible, um, and, and many have already uh, or should be you know independent of uh, of what the ultimate uh, decision in Fisher versus, versus University of Texas is um, to, to focus uh, your your recruitment and, and retention strategies and, and attention. Uh, 
to the first generation student population. Uh, so something to think about uh, as, as you go back uh, to the meeting rooms on your own campus and, and, and are considering how, uh, how your institution um, may uh, improve upon your existing efforts uh, focused on first gen students or, or start new initiatives in, in, in outreach and recruitment and, and, and retention uh, of first gen students. So Dan mentioned a, a whole lot of, of tentacles uh, that, that, that make up this, this strategy for Franklin and Marshall. Um, uh, one, of, uh, one of those partnerships uh, is with uh, CSO and, and I'm first and, and we wanted to uh, briefly introduce for you guys uh, you know, how we are working with colleges and universities to, uh, to, to not only better promote uh, your institutions uh, and, and the programs and opportunities you do offer for first generation college students, but collaborate in, in, in some more strategic uh, ways to, to help build and strengthen uh, your efforts uh, for these first generation students. We've talked about the I'm First project and invite colleges and universities to get behind that effort in sharing stories from your campus community, not only in, in, in providing uh, stories and, and examples uh, for, for younger students to look up to, but certainly to brag a little bit about uh, the good work that, that, that your school is doing and uh, the, the students you're producing and, and, and this commitment to first generation college students uh, among your faculty and staff. Um, but beyond that effort, uh, there, are, um, there are other ways uh, that, that we're working with colleges and universities and, and wanted to uh, invite uh, Krista, um, who works on the I'm First team, uh, to, to, to share a little bit uh, about what we're doing on that end. Great. Well, thanks, Matt, for the introduction, and Gil and Zinch for helping us to present this webinar to you all, and for Dan for sharing um, your story about being a first gen and all the great work that Franklin and Marshall is doing. Um, welcome all. Uh, for those who may be interested in CSO partnership to serve first gens, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what that partnership means. A partnership is twofold. It allows you to directly connect to motivated first-gen college students, and it helps you to build an awareness of your institution and those programs and services on campus directly serving first-gens. Colleges and universities partnering with uh, CSO become a, a part of a network, or as we like to refer to it, a community of college partners, all with a similar commitment to supporting first gens on your campus. Currently, uh, we are asking everyone in our college partners and non-partners to participate in the I'm First project by showcasing stories from your first generation college students, graduates, faculty, staff, and trustees, as Matt mentioned uh, earlier and was able to briefly show you a screenshot of the website. Um, other colleges who have been featured uh, and have featured faculty include Bucknell and their pres president John Braveman, um, as well as you saw Dan, and Dr. Hawkins at Union College in Kentucky. Um, another facet of college partnership is an I'm First College profile and user account which gives you direct access to thousands of motivated first-generation college-bound students through the site. And what's unique about an I'm First profile is that along with featuring your institution, we highlight those unique programs that you provide for first-generation college students. And here you can see a screenshot of the search engine we built for students to help them find your institution's profile. Um, on the left that you can see filterable fields that students can use to narrow in on their search. And then here is a screenshot of an example of Berea College's profile on I'm First. And the layout, layout of the profile is customized to what's of interest to the first generation populations we serve. Uh, for example, on the left, you can see a statistical view of statistics and figures of, imp of importance to first gens as they make their decisions about college. Statistical highlights include student body demographics, retention and graduation rates, and affordability metrics. The body of the profile is designed to highlight programs like Summer Bridge and First Year Transition, Student Support Services, Academic Advising, Peer Mentoring, Multicultural Opportunities, Scholarships and Financial Aid Opportunities that your campus may offer. 
add on first, students are the drivers in the seat to ask in looking at colleges of interest with a lens of what's in it for me as a college student. And over the past few years here at CSO, we have learned how important CBOs and college access programs have become for our partners' recruitment efforts, as Dan also highlighted in speaking about Franklin and Marshall. Another portion of partnership is a direct access to a national database of college access programs and community-based organizations through MFIRST. And here we've compiled a database of over 1,000 CBOs and college access programs, and this number is still growing. And we've transitioned this database online as a service for our college partners. Our CBO database has been built through our collaboration and partnerships with associations such as the National College Access Network and National Partnership for Educational Access. CSO also works with institutions like Teach for America and America's Promise Alliance. We also include charter school networks that conduct college prep work to serve low-income students such as KIPP and the Crystal Ray Network. This database allows for our partners to go just beyond high school visits during recruitment and connect with these organizations serving thousands of youth. And here's a screenshot of a CBO uh, profile that's featured through MFIRST. And I actually just had a call with one of our college, our college partners at Bucknell University. And the Bucknell team made a note of how useful the CBO directory has been for them in their recruitment efforts of what they refer to as secondary cities, those smaller cities such as Scranton, Pennsylvania. And in an effort to assist our college partners in recruiting more in areas outside of major cities, we are currently adding TRIO programs and exploring the idea of adding other youth-based organizations that do not necessarily focus specifically on college access, but work to serve youth in some way, such as YMCA and Boys and Girls Club. And as a college partner, your institution is also promoted through MFIRST e-newsletters. And these newsletters reach over 40,000 students, counselors, and college access providers across the nation. And our revamped monthly newsletter, which you see here, highlights those opportunities for first-gen students on, on your college campus. It is another way to also connect to our community of college partners and see who is providing similar services supporting first-gens. College partners are also given inclusion in the College Access and Opportunity Guide, which is a unique college guidebook designed to help first-generation college students make their college dreams become a reality. And since its first publication in 2008, CSO has distributed over 20,000 copies nationwide. And every year, our college partners help us sponsor a distribution of a few thousand copies to high schools, community-based organizations, and youth services of their choice. And unlike typical college guidebooks, CSO's College Access and Opportunity Guide also features those programs and resources colleges offer in support of first-generation students. Students, their families, and high school counselors can find full description of the resources that they need most. And lastly, college partners can participate in best practice webinars. And on a regular uh, basis, best practice webinars engage our community of college partners to share successful recruitment and retention tactics for first-generation college students. Topics are partner-driven, and in the past they've included topics such as the power of peer near me mentoring and how to work with CBOs. We are aiming to expand this effort further by incorporating a series of white papers also based on webinar topics. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Matt. Thanks so much, Krista. Um, great quick overview. Um, obviously, we uh, we didn't want to turn this webinar into a, into a sales or a partnership pitch by any means, but wanted to give a brief overview and an introduction to, to the work that, that CSO and I'm First is, is doing with uh, colleges and universities across the country. Um, if you're an institution who cares about first-generation college students and isn't yet involved uh, with the I'm First project, we'd love to hear from you, um, learn more about uh, your school and, and your efforts uh, in support of first-gen students, um, and answer any questions you have uh, about uh, getting involved uh, in, in our program. Um, with that, I, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, a Q&A. Um, Gil, uh, hopefully you've been uh, receiving some, some questions, or if not, now would be 
uh, the time for you guys to, to type in any questions that you have for for any of us um, uh, into your your questions box. Yes, thank you, Matt, uh, Krista, and Dan. Really appreciate the great content and presentation. Hopefully, uh, the information that we provided today has been helpful to all of our attendees. Um, for those who might not be familiar with the GoToWebinar uh, program, on the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, um, there's a there should be a section that ti that's titled Questions. Um, if you have questions uh, for our, any of our panelists, feel free to type them in that box, and we will res we have a little bit of time um, still for the the remainder of the of the webinar to be able to answer those questions. So uh, if you put, put those in there, I will I will field them to the to the group and we'll hopefully be able to answer them. And we, we do have a question from, from Beatrice. Um, she asks, what are some challenges you see private institutions who are not able to meet 100% need? Dan, as our, as our college rep, you want to speak to that? Yeah, so so what, what are the challenges for institutions that don't meet 100% uh, need? Yeah, so I, I, I think that there, there, there are challenges even if you do uh, meet 100% need uh, because uh, it, I, I'm very fortunate to work for an institution that, that not only meets need but meets it gener generally uh, with, with, with scholarship and grant aid. So you got to really understand and unpack, you know, what even meeting need mean uh, there, there, there are definitely differences in how people package uh, with, with with debt and other types of financing opportunities um, you know the, the question is is the value of what you're paying for going to going to be uh, a met when you graduate is it going to launch you on a trajectory and give you the full slate of options that you want to have uh, when you graduate now there's there's, there's quite a bit of um, national conversation about student debt. Uh, everyone's, you know, seen the big headline, you know, uh, over a trillion dollars in the portfolio uh, of, of student loan debt. Um, and, and so we've gotten this kind of reactionary culture that all, uh, you know, loans for college are bad. Um, I, I'm here to tell you as someone that's taken out loans for undergrad and loans for law school um, that uh, not all debt is bad. It's an investment in oneself. Um, the national uh, average for, for student, you know, indebtedness is around $27,000. If you went out and bought a Ford Taurus today, that's about what it would cost you. I, I, I got to believe that your investment in your own education is more valuable than a Ford Taurus. Um, so I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep question. Now, I, I think for if you're on the institutional side and you know that, that you are not meeting full need, um, you know, I, 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 how are you enhancing the value? Um, and you should be advocating internally about the importance of, of doing that for as many students as you can. Um, I, I think that there's tremendous inefficiency in our, in our financial aid system. Um, as most schools nowadays, believe it or not, are, are merit-based systems. Um, I think there, there's about $2 billion a year that's given out in merit aid, um, which we you know, I'm, I'm not mad at the families that, that, that receive it, but the system that, that is supporting that type of inefficiency when there's a, there, there are probably a, a billion dollars um, of need-based aid that families that attend college don't receive. So I think we need to be advocates. We need to be advocates for the first-generation experience. We need to be advocates for, um, you know, uh, uh, some, some equity in how we, we package. Um, and we, we, we need to, on our own campuses, ensure that we're pushing hard uh, to, to, to package people in, in the fairest way so that it's a reasonable investment for the return that they get at the end of the day. Thanks, Dan. And, and I might just add to that that obviously the, the, the cost and financial aid issue is huge for, for this population. And, and uh, you know, as, as Dan was speaking to, there, there is you know, the, in, in some cases, that, that's a hurdle that, that isn't, isn't necessarily going to be uh, jumped. But, but in, in, in places where it can be, I think it, it's critical for us to be talking to students and families about not just getting to college, but, but getting through college. And in, in some instances uh, where an institution isn't meeting full need, and it may mean that the student or family needs to 
you know, pay uh, a higher tuition than they would somewhere else or take out loans to afford their education, um, that, that that return on investment uh, may be, you know, may be well earned, uh, you know, in, in the sense that, that you will be uh, choosing an institution where your likelihood to persist and, and ultimately graduate, which really is the, the true goal, um, is most likely. So what we try to do uh, at CSO and, and, and through the I'm First project is, is help students uh, consider, you know, the, their, their college options in terms of you know, where am I going to be most successful? Uh, where, what school is going to support me in and out of the classroom? And certainly, a big part of that equation is uh, is the cost and, and financial aid. But there's other factors to that as well. And, and so we feel it's important that students uh, appreciate and understand that as they're making informed college decisions, um, where they apply and ultimately enroll. And, and as as you guys on the college end are talking to prospective students and families, uh, perhaps, you know, emphasizing those factors uh, um, can be helpful. Great answers. Okay, we have another question from Molly um, who asks, aside from cost, what are the top perhaps three concerns you hear from families of prospective first-generation students during the college search process? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll jump first, but I know that, that, that Matt and Krista will also have some, some, some great uh, 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 details to, to, to share. Um, in, in, in my experience and in our experience, uh, cost is definitely a big thing. Um, uh, distance from home uh, is definitely a, a, a big thing. Uh, whether or not there's a supportive culture for uh, the background that the student is, is coming from, uh, the perception of, of how they're going to uh, uh, fit in, fit is a big deal, um, and a full understanding as a liberal arts college um, of what that actually means. Um, you know, when, when you, quite frankly, like my family uh, growing up, it would, it, it's easier to explain accounting, uh, it's easier to explain engineering, it's easier to explain, you know, uh, more professional oriented uh, labels and titles and majors um, and the challenge in our liberal arts environment is that we generate you know incredible results in all of these fields um, but when you read the the brochure or the document uh, translating what what anthropology and history uh, and economics uh, and all of these traditional liberal arts majors uh, uh, what they extrapolate to be in the world is also um, a challenge in when, when recruiting first-generation communities. Thanks, Dan. You hit on a number of the big ones. I, I think I would add to that and almost kind of preface uh, those answers with the, the notion that so many would-be first-generation college students still, still lack uh, an understanding or an appreciation of the, the, the college opportunities that, that do exist for them, even highly motivated, uh, talented students because their parents didn't go to college and, and aren't able to, to offer much in the way of, of information or support, feel their, their college options are, are very limited um, and, and that college may not be accessible to them or some colleges may not be accessible to them. And, and I think it's just simply a factor of, of, of access to information and awareness that is directing so many students, you know, beyond the cost issue, uh, to um, you know, to, uh, to 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 post-secondary options where 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 they might not be put in in a position for the greatest likelihood of success. And so, I think you know, there's a there's there's a first kind of collective imperative for us to just help raise a, awareness uh, of the array of college opportunities. That, that do exist for these students and that, that first generation students are welcomed on uh, traditional campuses and, and other places that, uh, that, that, that have great support structures and, and programs and services in place to, to make sure these students are successful um, on, uh, on their campuses. So um, you know, perhaps that uh, you know, is another, another answer to your question. 
Absolutely, and just to, to echo what Matt was saying, I'm also a first generation uh, college student, and something that I found important in my experience in, in talking about a supportive culture is mentoring and advising. Um, not only was it important to know if this college was going to be a good fit for me, but it was also important to know if this college was going to help me find a major or a career field that was also of a good fit. And so I'd also like to just echo that mentoring and advising uh, supports are also important as a first gen. We have a question for Dan. Um, what, has your, what has your institution implemented to support the retention of first generation students and or those students who have been able to gain access because you are meeting 100% of their needs? Yeah, so I, I think that that uh, uh, retention uh, support, those are all uh, very, very important initiatives and topics that, that go in tandem uh, with this work. Um, I'll, I'll even, uh, uh, but, but even before that, I'll, 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 I'll say something that might be provocative um, because I'm sure we have a, a wide range of schools and, and people with different, that went to different types of schools. Um, you know, the design of the small residential liberal arts college is, is in essence, uh, a, a, a re retention machine. Um, because of small classes and that interaction with faculty, uh, data will show the more positive interactions that you have with faculty early on, the more likely you are to be retained. The more positive uh, uh, adult uh, role models that you encounter in college, the more likely you are to be re retained. Um, and, there, and because of the size of our campus um, you know, and student body, you are less likely to fall through the cracks. Uh, so we are perfectly situated uh, to, to do uh, this type of outreach and work. Even still, even still, we had to think more about the changes uh, that were going to be made to our, our community uh, in its composition, um, to think about people that bring a different set of, of, of capital uh, and currency um, and to allow them to uh, of, see that their currency is just as, as valuable as others um, that come from more, more uh, experienced backgrounds with, with college and higher education. So we, we have definitely uh, uh, done a number of things, including uh, uh, staffing up uh, in our, our support system. As I mentioned, we've, we've taken the kind of posse model and, and uh, even for students that are not in posse, giving them uh, a faculty a small group mentorship. Uh, throughout their uh, uh, first and second year experience. Um, we, we're, we're proud of the work that we do in our Office of Multicultural Affairs for those students that uh, uh, have uh, a want, a desire, or an exploration to uh, get into safer, small segments of our community. Um, and then I, I think that showing people what they can do with their great education and launching them and giving them experiential opportunities very early on in the process is super important. Um, so we've completely revamped uh, what we're doing uh, in our, our postgraduate development work, um, motivated by the changes in the student body, uh, going uh, more in the, in the direction of first generation students. But one of the, the, the great things about all of this work is that it's making it better for all students. You know, we were good in career services, we are getting great in postgraduate development. And it's not just for our first gen students. It's not just for our underrepresented students. It's for everyone. So this is actually leading us to being even more accountable for every individual student on our campus um, and their different um, um, experiences. And then the icing um, kind of on the cake is that we've hired a, a, a senior level partner um, as our, our, our senior associate dean. Um, of assessing uh, uh, student outcomes, uh, who's a, a PhD level sociologist who happens to be an alumnus of the college, who is literally assessing everything that we do uh, in our student experience, our academic experience, to ensure that we are forever improving on delivering um, a, a supportive and world class uh, academic and, and residential uh, experience. So that, that's some of what we're doing. This might, serves as a good follow-up to the tail end of that answer. 
Um, this is a question from Michael. Uh, when talking to stakeholders, be it alumni, faculty, board members, et cetera, some feel that opening the doors to more first generation students will somehow lower the quality of education at the lower the quality of the college because they are inviting more quote unqualified students. How do we sell these skeptical individuals on the importance of opening the doors and improving access? Well, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's um, boy, is that, is that an important topic, right? So, so thank you for whoever asked that question for, you know, putting, putting a voice to something that's ever present on lots of campuses. Um, the, the reality is that that is just a falsehood. It's absolute falsehood. Um, and there's, there's data behind it. In our, in our experience uh, at FNM, as we expanded access, expanded financial aid, um, we've recruited uh, the, the, the strongest two uh, uh, first-year classes uh, almost in the history of the college over these past two years with, with definitely a huge expansion in, in our underrepresented population and our first-generation students and our Pell Grant uh, uh, available students. Um, you know, when, when people say that, um, I, I would definitely say, well, geez, it doesn't, you know, think who, who, who's at the top of your peer group? Who would your school love to be? And I'm telling you, the ones that are really at the top of the pyramid there, um, look at their diversity. Look at their uh, populations of, of, of socioeconomic uh, diversity. Look at their, um, you know, uh, 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 levels of, of, of students of color. Um, it's not compromising their academic quality, is it? So I, I just think it's very, very strange, you know, not unusual, but it's, 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 it's a false argument. There are arguments like, can we afford it? Now, that's, that's a question that every campus is going to have to, you know, answer. But I believe the future of, of, of higher education, um, as with as many disruptive things coming up in the future, and the fact that the future of our country uh, is going to really depend on generating leaders from what historically have been underserved populations, that the colleges that do that best are going to be here flat out 20 years from now. The colleges that, that tackle this, this, these, this, this time of transition and come out on the other side of it um, you know, with, with a, a completely representative and empowered um, alumni body of people from the full American mosaic are the ones that are going to are going to survive and are going to thrive. Um, and if you're not on that train, I just I just don't know what demographic data um, these folks are looking at. How, how do they foresee uh, being uh, you know uh, a majority uh, uh, you know uh, 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 white campuses or majority uh, of you know uh, of campuses of, of wealthy students when fewer students can afford to pay the full cost. Or a majority of students being, uh, you know, or dominantly being uh, not uh, first-generation college attenders. The, the, the numbers just don't speak to that in the United States, and they're not going to. So, uh, you know, I, I think they either need to move, or they really risk the future of the institution. All right. So we have a question from. Alex. Um, Alex is curious about how non-first generation students, typically from majority backgrounds, are responding to an increase of first generation efforts. Um, as a posse student himself, campus-wide training could be important for retention. What might be some ideas for this? Well, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a sociologist and I, and I don't have data at, at, at my fingertips. Um, but on our campus, uh, we, we are seeing uh, a, a tremendous uh, uh, levels of, of, of um, just students being very satisfied with, with their experience of coming to campus. Um, we firmly believe that uh, uh, diverse perspectives in the classroom um, has academic purpose, um, it has academic value, um, and enhances the learning experience for all students. So our, our, we're very proud of, of our majority students, um, and they are being benefited from uh, this experience. Um, you know, there's, there's no question that to be a leader uh, in the 21st century and beyond, uh, you are going to have to, have to be able to navigate, not only navigate, not only coexist, but be able to have demonstrated uh, facility 
with uh, leading a diverse group of uh, employees, um, partners, and other constituents. I don't care what you're going to do. If you're, if you're, you know, if you're headed towards a rock star experience uh, in corporate America, in higher education, in medicine, in law, um, you are going to be at a serious deficit if you are not uh, challenging yourself as a majority student to understand uh, communities that are different from you. Um, and I believe that there is compelling data about the, 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 the academic um, um, benefits of diversity, and I also believe that there's you know, compelling data about uh, what, what that does for the trajectory of someone uh, being launched into uh, powerful careers. All right, well, it looks like that's all of the questions that we have. Um, thank you all so much again for taking the time out to attend this presentation. As you can see, the panelists' contact information is there on your screen. Uh, we will be sending a recording of this presentation out after uh, the conclusion of the webinar. So feel free to pass the presentation on to all of your colleagues um, and anybody else that you feel would benefit from the presentation. But um, with that, thank you all again for taking the time out and enjoy the rest of your day.